Welcome to the conservative intellectual tradition in America. Today we're going to be talking about the end of big government. We're going to be looking at the economic consensus that developed between the left and the right in American politics as well as their differences. We're going to look at the Clinton administration's economic policy and the triumph of supply side economics and the repudiation of Keynesian economics. Our guest lecturer today is Dr. Daniel J. Mitchell. Dr. Mitchell's illustrious career began in the United States Senate working for Oregon Senator Bob Packwood. Mitchell left that position in 1990 to join the Heritage Foundation focusing on tax policy issues, restraining the size of government, and income tax reform. In 2007, Mr. Mitchell joined, Dr. Mitchell, pardon me, joined the Cato Institute as a senior fellow where he directs efforts on tax policy and issues such as the flat tax and international tax competition. In 2000, he co-founded the Center for Freedom and P Prosperity. That's an organization formed to protect the United States in international tax competition. He's the author of Tax Revolution, The Rise of Tax Competition, and The Battle to Defend It with Chris Edwards. And his work has been published in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, USA Today, Forbes, National Review, numerous other pro publications, as well as numerous law reviews. And he's even been published in Playboy magazine. <laughs> it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce Dr. Daniel J. Mitchell. Dan? Thank you very much. Uh, I was actually published in a German edition of Playboy. I don't read German, so all I can do is look at the pictures, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> Mallory's a, a pretty smart guy. He's teaching a class, but getting other people to come in and do all the work. So I definitely want to aspire to, uh, to uh, do exactly what, what he's doing. Uh, my job today is to cover something that normally should take uh, months and months of seminar analysis. We're going to try to cover the entire uh, history of economics as it relates to public policy and do it all in a one hour time period. Uh, so, we're going to necessarily uh, be just touching on lots of issues in a very brief period of time. Uh, let me start by explaining a little bit about economic growth, because that's really what this discussion is all about. And if you want to know what causes economic growth, uh, there's definitely a consensus on this. Everyone agrees that the way you get economic growth is uh, with the two factors of production, capital and labor. And if you want more economic output in your economy, you want people to have higher living standards, you really have uh, four things that you can do. You can provide more labor to the economy, you can provide more capital to the economy, or you can utilize the existing labor more efficiently, or you can utilize the existing capital more efficiently. But that's it. That there are no other factors of production. Everything that you think about there that might lead to economic growth is in some way tied uh, to those two factors of production. But here is where, here's the, the key thing about how you mix those factors of production where government policy enters into the discussion. You have these two ingredients, capital and labor. Think of it like you're making a cake. Who is the chef? How do those two ingredients, capital and labor, get mixed together? Is your chef the private sector, broadly speaking? Are you relying on people like Steve Jobs uh, to be the chef who's mixing the capital and labor together? Or are you relying on the political class to do it? Uh, uh, are you relying on central planners in Washington? Are you relying on politicians in a national capital? I mean, who's the person who is actually mixing the capital and labor together? And what are the implications uh, of those decisions for economic prosperity? And in, in some sense, this is the theme that will run through the entire hour of remarks, is figuring out what is the best way to make sure that we get the maximum output for the given amounts uh, and the efficiency levels of capital and labor that are in the economy. And it does matter because economic growth over time makes a big difference in terms of the prosperity of your people. Uh, here are a couple of numbers. If your economy grows 7% a year, you double your GDP. It's a simple mathematical formula. You double your GDP in 10 years. If your economy grows 1% a year, you double your GDP in 70 years. 
And think about it this way. You, you look at high growth tiger economies, uh, some of the Baltic nations like Estonia, uh, Ireland uh, back in the uh, 90s and last decade, uh, Hong Kong over 50, 60 years. You look at these economies that grow five, six, seven percent a year, and you can see by looking at the long run data uh, from places like the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, so on and so forth, you can see how these countries were literally within uh, at least our parents' lifetimes, these were very poor jurisdictions that became much more prosperous because they managed to have sustained rapid rates of economic growth for multi-year periods. On the other hand, you look at, say, some of the European economies that are stagnating and in trouble right now, and if they have 0% growth or 1% growth or only 2% growth uh, for, for a period of several decades, uh, yeah, maybe they're still growing, uh, but they're falling behind compared to the rest of the world. And, and I suppose if I was to get you to understand one thing from this lecture, or remember one thing when you're thinking about public policy, long-term trend lines are critical. Uh, if an economy is growing 1% a year over the long run, doesn't matter where it starts. Sooner or later, it's going to fall behind a country growing 4, 5, 6% a year. Uh, and of course, if one country starts out richer than the other and has that 4, 5, 6% growth, while another country has 1% growth, then obviously the country with 1% growth is going to fall farther and farther and farther behind. Uh, another way to think about it, just in terms of your own household, uh, imagine how much better off, presumably, if you're at least if you're average, how much better off you are compared to your grandparents and how much better off your grandparents are than their grandparents before then. And that is all simply a function of how much economic growth there is in a society. And just by way of background, the U.S. for the last 100 plus years, we've been averaging about 3% real growth. And what do I mean by real growth? Is that as opposed to fake growth? No, it's real growth in the sense that it's adjusted for inflation. Uh, you know, we, we might have uh, three times as much income as our grandparents, or four times as much, but that's in nominal dollars. You want to measure it in real dollars, because that actually measures how much more purchasing power you have compared to your, uh, your ancestors, or how much purchasing power, what the living standards are of the average American today versus 30 years ago, 60 years ago, so on and so forth. And so we've had this adjusted for inflation, 3% economic growth, really going back to about 1870. It's amazing. If you, if you chart the trend line and then you chart actual economic growth, you know, the, the actual economic growth always oscillates around that 3% line. Uh, and so the whole question is, is there something that we could be doing to get more of the, uh, say, 5% growth that you see in Hong Kong and Singapore and are there things that we should be doing to avoid you know, the 1% growth that you get in a country like Italy? And, and the, a lot of this whole discussion that I'm going to be talking about is what is the role of public policy in determining why some countries have faster economic growth, better economic performance than other countries? And I suppose the, the way to start in talking about this is to uh, look at these different indexes of economic freedom. Uh, the Fraser Institute in Canada publishes something called the Economic Freedom of the World Index. My old employers at the Heritage Foundation uh, publish something called the Index of Economic Freedom. But you also have the World Economic Forum does their Global Competitiveness Report. Uh, and if you look at all these different measures that are out there, you'll find that they're very, very similar. And you can actually break down the, the building blocks uh, of economic prosperity into five basic categories. And they are rule of law, trade, regulation, monetary policy, and fiscal policy. Now, I'm a fiscal policy economist, so the latter part of my lecture will mostly focus on the role of taxes and spending and things like that. But if you look at these indexes, fiscal policy is only 20% of a nation's grade. A matter of fact, all these five categories, roughly speaking, are, are responsible for 20% of how a nation performs uh, economically. Uh, and the way that I think about it that I think is very helpful is that the first one I mentioned, rule of law. And rule of law isn't just rule of law. It's property rights. It's the legal system. Uh, it's the presence of corruption versus honest government. There's a whole series of institutional structures that, in some sense, serve as the foundation for, for an economy. If you don't have those fundamentally sound and honest institutions in your government, and I'm not saying they have to be perfect, but at least you want to be on the right side 
uh, of, of the ledger on these things. If you have basically honest rule of law, legal system, court structure, honest policing, non-corrupt government, you don't have to pay bribes to do things and stuff like that. If you have that structure correct, then you build a house upon it of economic policy. But if you don't get that foundation right, it doesn't matter really what sort of house you build upon the foundation because the foundation isn't going to be very strong. And so when you think about, for instance, why are so many countries in the developing world, why do they stay poor? Uh, well, it's not because they have big bloated governments, because usually they don't. It's not because they have heavy regulation, although oftentimes that's a problem. The real problem in the, in the developing world is that they don't have the right institutions. And without the right institutions, I mean, think about it. Remember, what gives, us, uh, what gives us economic growth? Capital and labor, those two major ingredients. People who put capital at work in the economy put capital at work because they expect deferred benefits. When you invest, generally speaking, you're not making money the first year. You're hoping to make money down the road. Well, how likely are you to invest in an economy where you can't trust those structures, those institutions of government to treat you fairly. So if you want the capital to be mixed with the labor in your economy, and you have to have both. I mean, if you don't have both, then you might as well just be a hunter, uh, gatherer, forager in the Stone Age. You need capital to en enable you to produce more, to have good living standards. And the problem in the developing world is that that fundamental foundational issue of the rule of law, property rights, honest government, so on and so forth, that's usually what's missing. We're lucky in the Western world. We're lucky in the Western world that even if you're in a big high-tax European welfare state, for the most part, and again, there's degrees of, of, of how well countries satisfy these tests, but uh, for the most part, in the Western world, they do satisfy uh, these basic conditions. Uh, uh, so that's the rule of law. Uh, let's now look at, uh, at uh, monetary policy, uh, trade policy, regulation, and fiscal policy. Uh, and let's take monetary policy first, because if you were to look at one issue where governments are most likely to throw an economy off the tracks, almost always you will find monetary policy uh, somehow involved. You look at some of the major dislocations in our economy's history. You look back at the Great Depression. You look back at the 1970s. You look at the recent financial crisis. And almost always you find a situation where the Federal Reserve uh, engaged in a boom-bust policy where initially they had a period of too much monetary creation. Uh, they, uh, they created too much liquidity in the economy. Uh, and then when they realized that they had made a mistake, they pulled back. And unfortunately, the very act of creating too much money inevitably means that they have to pull back and, in effect, bakes into the cake some sort of economic dislocation. It can take the form of a financial crisis. It can take the form of the 1970s stagflation. It can be something like the Great Depression. And I, I'm not implying that there's any time one single explanation uh, for these issues. You look at the Great Depression, and it, yes, maybe monetary policy was a triggering factor in the Great Depression, but then you had protectionism with the Smoot-Hawley tariff. You had Hoover raising the uh, uh, income tax rates from 25% to 63%. Uh, you had a doubling of the burden of federal spending. You had all sorts of government inter you know. So anytime you're looking at a period in our economic history, keep in mind you have these five big factors, which of course all sorts of sub-indices inside those five big factors, and each of those big factors is responsible for 20%. But again, the monetary 20%, you don't notice it when it's going well. Because, and also you don't notice rule of law if it's going well. It's something in the background of an economy, enabling an economy to function smoothly. If your money is stable, if the purchasing power is stable, if there's no uh, efforts by the politicians to tinker and, and use monetary policy for a short-term jiggering of the economy, you don't notice it. Just like you don't notice if you're honest, sound government and rule of law. It just, it gives you an environment in which you can function. You notice if you're in Argentina and inflation's 30%. You notice if you're in Zimbabwe and you have hyperinflation. Yes, then you notice monetary policy. Just like if you're in some developing country where you can't open a business without paying bribes to 10 different people in 10 different government departments, then you notice the rule of law is missing. Or you notice if you're an investor, all of a sudden the government expropriates your property and you have no access to an honest court system, then you notice that the rule of law isn't there. But the rule of law is the foundation. You ideally never notice it because it's being done right. 
and, uh, and monetary policy is sort of the, uh, the oil in the engine of the economy. You only notice it if all of a sudden your engine freezes up and you have a big problem. So that's really the way to think about monetary policy. Uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about trade. Uh, this is one area where I think the title of, uh, of my speech definitely applies, uh, which is whether there's a consensus. Uh, almost everybody today, outside of maybe a few, uh, a few exceptions, almost everybody today understands that free trade is a good idea. You can go all the way back to Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations, you can go back even before then, and the notion that the, the bigger your market is, uh, the more you're able to specialize, uh, these are things, when we, when we trade with each other, we become richer. Imagine, you know, let's, let's be very simplistic about it. Imagine if all of us were responsible for growing our own food, producing our own clothing, building our own house, we'd obviously be a lot poorer because none of us can be good at all those things. We're not able to specialize. We're not able to utilize uh, the efficient allocation of labor and capital. And so trade is a very good thing. Uh, it used to be that governments were very protectionist, especially in the pre-World War II era. One of the big factors in the Great Depression uh, was uh, protectionism with the Smoot-Hawley tariff. Uh, but free trade, really, you'd go back to, uh, to, the, uh, to England in the mid-1800s. Uh, when you really began to have develop the notion that free trade as an economic policy was a very good idea. I don't know if you've had history and you've read about the corn laws and things like that, it, you know, more detail than we want to get into here. Uh, but, you know, of course, Adam Smith wrote his Wealth of Nations back in 1776, but it took a while for that to seep into the political system, into the consciousness of policymakers. They began to understand that protectionism necessarily made an economy poorer. Uh, and as free trade began to take off, first with England as an island trading nation, uh, then of course everyone backslid, not everyone, but mo most everyone backslid uh, with the Smoot-Hawley tariff and other protectionist initiatives around the world. But then, uh, after World War II, there was a very conscious decision on the part of policymakers. They saw how world trade collapsed by about two-thirds with the protectionism of the 1930s. Of course, there was also a depression, so that would have necessarily reduced world trade as well. But the policymakers learned a very big lesson. When you put in place protectionism, you're going to make your economy poor. And so one area where there definitely has been a consensus, and for the most part, I think there's a consensus that inflation's a bad idea, and there's a consensus that rule of law is a good idea. So, so these are some areas where there has been a consensus that you want to try to move government out of the way so people can trade freely with each other, so economies can focus on the things where they are the most efficient. And the logic of trade and the logic of free trade, to be more specific, uh, it's the same as it makes sense for there to be free trade between South Carolina and North Carolina. It, that's the exact same argument that there should be free trade between the U.S. and Canada. Or it's the exact same argument as there should be free trade between you and the local supermarket. You don't want government hindering uh, people in the economy, whether it's labor, whether it's consumers, whether it's capitalists. You don't want the government hindering uh, uh, what is the most efficient and, and effective decision for people to make uh, to improve their living standards. So, so trade's a big success story. L let's look now at the last two issues where uh, the consensus isn't quite as strong. Uh, let's look at regulation. The simple way of thinking about regulation, it's an area where the government allegedly steps in to correct what is arguably supposed to be a market failure uh, or to protect some sort of health and safety goal. Uh, market failure would be something like pollution. Uh, if there's no regulation, uh, I set up some sort of chemical factory to produce something. I might, if I was not a very ethical person, decide, okay, I'm just going to dump some toxic chemicals in the river that runs behind my factory. Uh, now, in theory, in the era before regulation, the tort system uh, protected against that because people would say, wait, I live downstream, you're doing me damage, you go to court. But the tort system was viewed as I guess an inefficient way of doing those things. And so that's when we began to have regulation in terms of addressing things like that. But you also have regulation in terms of things like basic safety. Um, you, know, you have a school zone. Uh, are you going to have a speed limit in front of the school zone? If you're going to have a speed limit, what's it going to be? Is it going to be five miles an hour? Is it going to be 50 miles an hour, 100 miles an hour? And so those are the decisions that people have to make when you're looking at the regulatory apparatus. Uh, 
And one of the most common things that you should have, and generally speaking, this is a consensus. Nobody's going to argue with this notion. What you should have is cost-benefit analysis. Now, that sounds very simple, and it, it is, of course, actually a simple uh, concept, but how does it actually work? That's where things get more challenging. Uh, everyone presumably agrees there should be speed limits. I gave the example of a school zone, but let's talk about an interstate highway. Uh, right now, I don't know how many deaths there are on the road uh, every year, but there's tens of thousands of deaths on the road. We could eliminate all auto fatalities by having national speed limits of five miles an hour. But would that make sense? that the cost of putting in place, even though there's a very clear benefit, we would save tens of thousands of lives every year by having five mile an hour national speed limits. We don't do that because we recognize on the other side of that regulation is a very, very high cost in terms of taking forever to get places and all the additional uh, costs that would impose uh, upon the economy. And so in various ways, different governments, it used to be we had a national speed limit, but now thankfully we're back to more of a federal system on that approach. Each state looks at, okay, what is our traffic density? What are the driving patterns? You know, what are our enforcement capabilities? And they make a cost-benefit trade-off. And the same thing exists in all sorts of ways. There's actually a division of the Office of Management and Budget in Washington. Uh, that division is the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. At least, I know it's OIRA. I think I have the, uh, the four words right. But OIRA, one of their responsibilities is to sort of be the regulatory overseer of all the different government agencies that are putting out different regulations. And one of the things that they're always looking for is what is the cost-benefit analysis. Agencies say, okay, we want to do X, we want to create a national speed limit of five miles per hour because our job is to protect, uh, is to reduce highway fatalities. But then someone like OIRA is sort of the adult oversight saying, well, wait, but you guys are only looking at one side of the equation. Uh, you're looking at the reduction in highway fatalities. We have to consider the overall economy. And so that's how, at least in theory, a lot of these decisions get made in Washington. And of course, some of this stuff becomes very controversial because not everyone makes the same assessments of what the costs of something are and what the benefits of something are. And then one other thing that you have to add to the equation then is that if your economy slows down and doesn't grow as fast, that has implications for the health and longevity of your population. There's very clear relationships in the literature between the income of a country and the lifespan of, a, of its people. If you're a very poor nation, uh, your, your, your lifespan uh, could be as little as, uh, it could be under 50 years. But if you're in a very wealthy nation, uh, lifespans are approaching 80 years. Uh, so if you pass a very expensive regulation that, uh, that harms the economy, even though in, you might be saying, well, we're going to save, you know, according to the scientific literature, we're going to save 14 lives by doing this very expensive regulation, but if that very expensive regulation causes your GDP uh, to be $100 million less, well, it turns out in the academic literature, and of course you ask five economists, you'll get seven opinions, but in some of the academic literature, there's data showing that to the extent that government knocks, uh, I think the last figure I saw was $6 million off your economic output, that causes one premature death. That's the relationship over time through an economy, $6 million less, at least in this one study, of economic output means one premature death. And most regulations are governed by looking at how can we prevent a premature death. Like we want to we wanna limit uh, the... Uh, you know, the, the sulfur dioxide that comes out of a certain, you know, coal plants or whatever it is, because we think that will avert, uh, you know, 17 premature deaths because of cancer rates and things like that. That's the kind of, you know, that's the weeds they get into when they're trying to do these types of things. But if you're reducing, say, 17 deaths at a cost of $35 million each, but $6 million of less economic output leads to a premature death according to other research, you have to somehow bring those two things together and figure out, okay, how much are we going to sacrifice in terms of economic output and what would the cost be in terms of premature deaths looking at it that way versus just looking at, okay, we're going to reduce sulfur dioxide or some pollutant by this much and we think it's going to have a, a beneficial effect on health. So with regulation, the way to think about it, it's always trade-offs. You're never going to reduce risk in a society. Every time you wake up, you cross the street, you get in a car, you fly in a plane. Peanut butter, 
How many people know that peanut butter is a carcinogen? Uh, that the federal government looks at and does measures. You eat a certain amount of peanut butter, it increases in some infinitesimal way. Every peanut butter sandwich you eat increases your risk of cancer. Now obviously a lot, lot less than every cigarette you might smoke, but that's what regulatory issues are all about. It's very complex. In theory, it should be very science oriented and you should be trying to figure out uh, what is what are the costs versus what are the benefits? Now, now that's the way it should work. Oftentimes, we get regulations uh, that arguably don't have any economic benefit, where the government will do things uh, like on a state level. They'll say, well, you can't be a florist unless you pass a government exam. You can't be an interior decorator without a government license. Uh, you can't sell uh, a wooden casket. Uh, even, I mean, there are regulations in different states for funeral homes that you have to buy caskets to get cremated in. Uh, and of course, that's mostly because the, the casket building uh, industry will lobby the state legislators to put in this requirement to buy a casket, even though if all that's happening is you're getting cremated, you probably don't really care that you're in a casket when the, uh, when the uh, jets get turned on. Uh, and, and so in situations like this, you might have regulatory burdens imposed, even though you're not actually able to measure in any way a benefit. Unless, of course, you think it's a benefit that you're unjustly enriching the, uh, the casket building industry or something like that. Uh, so when I talk about how, in theory, regulation should work, you then have to sort of move out of that theoretical world, which, of course, actually does apply to some extent in the real world. And then you want to look at the real world. How does regulation actually operate? And you see, in terms of the real world operation of regulation, that oftentimes different industries will use the regulatory process to try to obtain unearned wealth. And this is the theory uh, George Stigler, the late George Stigler, he was one of the Nobel Prize winners at the University of Chicago. He entitled this regulatory capture, which is the government creates a regulatory agency. The regulatory agency is supposed to do certain good things for the economy, but of course, over time, the regulated industry figures out, hey, let's go ahead and, uh, and use a lot of lobbying resources and make sure that we actually control that regulatory body so that that regulatory body can then pass rules that help the big, powerful companies in the industry. And that's oftentimes what you see is that regulations wind up benefiting big companies at the expense of small companies. And why is that? Because if you're a big company, you already have a very big legal staff, accounting staff, compliance staff, and all these things. And so if there's some new regulation that, say, will cost every firm $10 million, if you're a big corporation, $10 million might be an asterisk in your budget. If you're a small competitor, $10 million may put you out of business. And so the regulation and how it works in the real world is often different than the theory. But I want to stress something there is something very sound and legitimate in the theory. So, so even though at the Cato Institute we're considered a libertarian free market think tank, we have a very skeptical view of regulation, but it's a skeptical view of regulation in terms of in the real world how it operates, not regulation in the theoretical world of how it should operate, where you do an honest and legitimate assessment of trying to balance costs and benefits and looking at risks in the economy. And, and, and also, I should say, it goes beyond economics, uh, because there are certain things where um, hang gliding presumably is a very hazardous hobby to undertake. And I suppose if you just want to be, you know, some sort of actuary or accountant, you can say, well, that you know, has almost negligible impact on our GDP, and look how many deaths it causes, or people who go skydiving and parachuting and things like that. Think of all the deaths this leads to a year, and it, has only, uh, it only contributes 0.0001% to our GDP, and so a regulator might decide, well, we, we want to ban that. But then you have to begin to factor in whether well, other things that have to be part of your calculation. Simple human liberty and freedom. Uh, the ability to decide. I want to go out and try to surf 20-foot you know, waves in California. Uh, I want to be a skin diver and take a risk of a shark, shark attack. There are inherently dangerous things where the question is, should people have the freedom and liberty uh, to engage in those activities? And in theory, if you just did a, uh, a completely dispassionate cost-benefit analysis, you might say, no, people shouldn't be allowed to do that. Uh, and, and that really then gets into questions like you see in New York City. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg you know, wants to ban restaurants from having salt and things like that. He just had some new decision where he wants to stop 
companies, or maybe it's restaurants, from contributing food to homeless shelters if the fat levels, the salt levels, and things like that are above a certain level. So isn't that wonderful? We'd rather have homeless people go hungry than, heaven forbid, there be a little bit too much salt in their food. But you know, so these are some of the different issues that you raise when you're looking at uh, regulation and how it works on the economy. Let's now shift to my bread and butter, which, is, uh, which are fiscal issues. And I suppose when I say fiscal issues, we're really talking about three different things. And I'll break them down uh, as I continue with this part of the discussion. We're talking about deficits and debt. We're talking about government spending. And then we're talking about the tax code. But before I break down those three things, uh, let me go ahead and just walk through a very abbreviated fiscal history of the United States. Uh, very, very abbreviated. Uh, basically, from the founding of our country, uh, for a good, uh, you know, roughly 130, 170 years, depending on how you want to calculate it, we had limited government very much in the, uh, li along the lines of what our founding fathers envisioned. You look at the U.S. Constitution, you look specifically at Article 1, Section 8, you'll see the enumer enumerated powers of the federal government. It says the federal government, specifically Congress, has the power to uh, uh, levy and collect taxes, to do patent and copyright laws, to build post roads, uh, to, uh, to maintain a national defense. Uh, I think they specifically mentioned Army and Navy. They didn't quite envision an Air Force back then. Uh, but there, there are something like you know, 19 or 20 different specific clauses in Article 1, Section 8. One thing you will not find in Article 1, Section 8 is the Department of Agriculture. You won't find a Department of Energy. You won't find a Department of Education. Uh, almost, you won't find Social Security. You won't find Medicare. You won't find Medicaid. Most of what the federal government does today uh, would probably cause the Founding Fathers to roll over in their graves because Article 1, Section 8 is pretty clear. This is what you are allowed to do. And the rest of the Constitution is pretty clear. If you're not specifically given the authority and, and, and permission to do it, it's not the business of the federal government. So that system pretty much operated uh, certainly through the 1700s, 1800s, uh, into the 1900s. Uh, probably the first hiccup was the Progressive Era. The Progressive Era uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, was primarily characterized by a change in the view of the role of government. Our founding fathers very clearly read the Federalist Papers, read all the early writings. Matter of fact, the Cato Institute was named after letters from Cato, which were pamphlets done during the Revolutionary War. Uh, and all the analysis, all the writing, the spirit that animated the founding fathers was that government was a dangerous thing and that the purpose originally of the Articles of Confederation, but then shortly thereafter, the Constitution, the purpose of the Constitution was figuring out, okay, we need to have a government but we don't trust government. I forget, was it Payne or Washington who had the quote about government is like fire, a dangerous servant, a fearful master, something like that. I don't have the quote right, but you get the idea. And the purpose of the Constitution was figuring out how can we fence in government and guarantee individual rights so that people didn't have to worry about this dangerous entity that throughout the history of the world was associated with oppression and tyranny and abuse. And so the Founding Fathers, uh, took this idea that government is a, is a dangerous, risky thing. You need to have it because we haven't figured out how to have anarcho-capitalism yet. I actually went to graduate school with people who thought we could have it. We'd argue all day long about who, how national defense would be privately provided. So I was sort of considered a left winger in the graduate department. Uh, but the Founding Fathers set in place this system uh, that was designed to limit government. What characterized the progressive era was the notion that, hey, Government's not a dangerous thing that we should curtail. It's a wonderful force for good. And if we sort of unchain government from the Constitution, we can therefore have government go out and start doing things to make the world a more wonderful place. And the one thing that coincided with the Progressive Era that basically enabled that process to begin was that wonderful day in 1913 uh, when the income tax uh, became permissible because the 16th Amendment was adopted. Now, I suppose, to be fair, a little bit of history. We did have an income tax between, I think it was 1863 and 1872. Came into place as part of financing uh, uh, the North and the Civil War. Uh, we then had an income tax adopted in 1894, but it was then an 1895 Supreme Court decision that said, uh-uh, this is not authorized by the Constitution. 
Article 1, Section 8 does give you the ability to levy and collect taxes, but they had to be apportioned among the states, and obviously it's very difficult to design an income tax so that you're collecting a per capita similar amount from every state. Uh, so that pretty much killed the income tax. I'm an economist, not a lawyer. I'm sure it's much more detailed than that. But what happened is then the politicians put forward a proposed constitutional amendment, which obviously took two-thirds of both the House and Senate to get out of Congress, and then in 1913, three-fourths of the states ratified it. And what started out as a 14-page law with one two-page tax form with a top tax rate of 7%, of course, has morphed into the lovely internal revenue code that we all know and love today. Uh, so that was a very important point in time in terms of the fiscal and economic history of the United States. The next thing that happened that was fairly significant uh, was the New Deal because the New Deal is when we began to put in place uh, some of the welfare state, particularly welfare and social security. Uh, the next big thing that happened was the Great Society, and the Great Society is when we got Medicare and Medicaid. This was during the 1960s. And then I suppose if we're going to look at recent history, and again, we're just doing this a 30,000 foot snapshot so we can get into some of the economics of deficit spending and taxes here. Uh, the next thing that happened is we had a 20 year period uh, between 1980 and the end of the century, where under both Reagan and Clinton, there was a consensus that government was too big and that the burden of government spending should shrink. Uh, and, uh, and by and large, we sort of moved in that direction during the Reagan and Clinton years. Uh, but then we have this century, the Bush-Obama years, which are sort of the opposite of the Reagan-Clinton years, because we've seen a pretty constant expansion in the burden of government spending uh, that more than erased all the progress that we made uh, during the Reagan-Clinton years. Now, you know, to put it in the context of the title of is there a consensus, uh, this is the one area where I think there's not a consensus. Maybe there was a consensus during the Reagan-Clinton years about shrinking the burden of government, and then maybe there was a consensus, at least in Washington among politicians, to increase the burden of government during the Bush-Obama years. But a lot of the fiscal fights that we're now seeing in Washington are fights because there no longer is a consensus, because people are looking at, uh, at these fiscal issues and fighting over what is the proper size, scope, and role of the federal government. And of course, adding to that, if instead of looking at history, we sort of look at future history, uh, everyone is aware of the fact that because of the demographics of the population, because of the structure of the entitlement programs, uh, the very same problems that we are looking at in Greece today are going to happen to the United States unless something changes. Uh, so that's a little bit about the history. Let's now look at these, uh, these three big fiscal policy issues, deficits, spending, and, uh, and uh, taxes. When we're looking at deficits or debt, and just by way of definition, I'm sure you all know this, deficits are the annual borrowing that you do to finance government because you're spending more than you're collecting in revenue, and debt is simply the collection of all your past deficits uh, that add up. Uh, the simple way of thinking about it is uh, uh, if you have a big credit card balance because of your past spending, that's like your debt. Uh, the amount that you're spending each month over what you're collecting each month, that would be your deficit. Um, we have a deficit that is roughly 9% of GDP right now. Uh, we have a national debt that is, uh, there's actually several ways of measuring the national debt. There's your gross public debt, there's your uh, their gross national debt, publicly held debt, then there's unfunded liabilities. Uh, which is more of an actuarial measure. Uh, but basically, we have a national, an annual deficit of about 9% of GDP. We have a gross, public, a gross national debt of more than 100% of GDP. Our publicly held debt is more like, I think, 75% of GDP right now. But then if you're looking at the unfunded liabilities of the entitlement programs, uh, then you're talking about uh, by some measures, you know, 400, 500 percent of GDP, you start getting into, it's very difficult to measure because you have to do calculations of present value and what is your assumption on the interest rate when you're making that calculation. So it's a very amorphous and fuzzy way of trying to define things, but it's simply a measure of the fact that we've promised to spend this much in the future and we're only going to collect this much revenue. And how you measure that gap, it gets pretty complicated. When I look at deficits and debt, I suppose the number one thing I want to get across to people is that that is not the problem. That is the symptom of the problem. The problem that we have, as I'll talk about in the next section, is the burden of government spending. Because government spending, regardless of how it's financed, is what diverts resources from the productive sector of the economy. Uh, 
the, the higher your level of government spending, the more the politicians are being the chefs who are mixing the capital and the labor, and the less resources you have in the private sector for entrepreneurs to mix the capital and the labor. Now sometimes when I say that, uh, people say, wait, that, 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 that's wrong, because, because if you have deficits, you'll have high interest rates. Because what are interest rates? Interest rates are the price of borrowing. And if the government's borrowing more and more and more, we remember from our Economics 101 class, there are these supply and demand curves. And so the more government is borrowing, the more upward pressure that's going to put on the price of borrowing, and that's an interest rate. And I'm an economist. I believe in supply and demand curves. So I agree with that analysis. But here's the key thing. Just like it's very interesting and challenging to, to measure costs and benefits when you're looking at regulation, it's very interesting and challenging to measure what is the actual impact of government borrowing on the price of borrowing? And here's the example I use all the time. I go to McDonald's. I buy a McChicken sandwich for a dollar. That dollar menu is a pretty good deal. I even buy sometimes three McChicken sandwiches. In theory, my purchase of McChicken sandwiches at McDonald's is increasing the demand for McChicken sandwiches, which should put upward pressure on the price. But if my purchases of McChicken sandwiches are just a tiny drop in the bathtub, or maybe even a tiny drop in the lake of demand for McChicken sandwiches, then it's going to be very difficult to measure whether my McChicken purchases are having any effect on the price of McChicken sandwiches. And likewise, in a, in a world capital market of tens of trillions of dollars, even very large amounts of borrowing by the U.S. government might not be enough to have a significant effect on interest rates. Now, the smart people in the audience are saying, well, hold on a second. Look at what's happened in Greece. Their interest rates have shot up. But the reason that interest rates in Greece have shot up is, yes, because they're borrowing too much, but what's driving the interest rate up is not the pressure on the supply and demand of credit in the global economy. It's an assessment on the part of international investors that we don't trust the Greek government to pay us back. That's what's driving the higher interest rates in places like Greece. That's why we're seeing interest rates on government debt and some of the other European economies begin to climb. That's why historically there are relatively high interest rates on government debt for developing countries. Because these are the countries that have a greater history or greater likelihood of default. So it's the probability of default that is driving the high interest rates. It's not the demand of governments to borrow money causing interest rates economy-wide to rise. We have more government debt in the world today than ever before, and yet global interest rates are very, very low. Now, of course, like anything with economics, you always want to look at more than one factor. And the reason that interest rates are very low, it's not in spite of government borrowing, it's because the overall world economy is not that strong. There's a lot of capital in the world economy. So if there's not that much demand for private investment because governments are making policy mistakes that make it less likely you can earn a profit by investing, and if there's lots of capital uh, and savings being provided, especially from the East Asian economies, you know, that's going to affect the world interest rate. So that's why the cost of capital right now is very low even though uh, the, the burden of government borrowing, the demand by governments to borrow more and mo more money is at record levels. So yes, there are several factors going on with interest rates. I do think government borrowing puts upward pressure on interest rates, but I think the reason you see some countries with very high interest costs, it's all about the risk of default. It's not the supply and demand of, uh, of capital available for government borrowing. Now, I should say that if you had someone from the Congressional Budget Office here, giving this same presentation, they would make an argument, well, even if interest rates aren't high, uh, government borrowing has a very negative effect on the economy because you are diverting capital from private uses to government uses. And I wouldn't disagree with that either. Uh, but then you start getting into questions about, uh, is that the only thing that matters? And if you read some of the CBO analysis, they actually do act as if that's the only thing that matters. You look at some of the Congressional Budget Office research, and they will actually argue that higher tax rates are good for the economy. Why do they argue that higher tax rates are good for the economy? Because if you have higher tax rates, that's going to lead to less government borrowing, or maybe even a government surplus, which means that there's going to be more capital for the private sector, and that's going to lead to more economic growth. And I don't actually disagree with any of those uh, links in the chain of reasoning, but to assume that tax rates in and of themselves don't discourage economic growth, uh, 
I think it's a mistake. I think CBO is a little bit naive in assuming that if you raise taxes that politicians will actually use the money to reduce deficits instead of just spend the money. So there's, there's lots of problems with the CBO chain of reasoning, but there's also some, some truth to it. Obviously, at some level, too much government borrowing will get you in trouble. But again, I want to come back to what I said before, that it's the diversion of money from the productive sector of the economy by government spending, whether it's financed by borrowing or financed by taxes. That, I think, is what we want to look at. Uh, and I'll say one last thing about deficits and debt. Uh, uh, there's a very influential book that came out recently, and there's lots of studies that are, are associated with it, saying that 90% of GDP is a critical level when your government debt as a share of GDP gets above that level, then you begin to have very negative consequences for economic growth. That's obviously based on, a, on, a, on cross country data all aggregated together. Uh, I don't think it's a magic number. Japan has government debt of 200% of GDP. They haven't hit the brick wall yet. I think they will at some point because of their demographics, but they have 200% of debt as a share of GDP uh, and they're still surviving. After World War II, we had 125% of GDP uh, government debt and didn't stop us from growing. England was over 200% of GDP at the end of World War II. Didn't stop them from growing. On the other hand, Spain and Portugal have already gotten in trouble and required bailouts when they had government debt at about 65, 70% of GDP. So it really, 90% of GDP might be an average, but then you have to look at the characteristics of the country because some countries will get in trouble at much lower levels. I guarantee you, Argentina would default well before it got to 90% of GDP. Uh, whereas you know, a country like Japan, uh, you know, they might survive just fine until they get to 300% of GDP. It's hard to know. Let's now shift to, uh, to spending. I've already mentioned that I think government spending is the most important variable to look at because it is government spending that diverts the resources from the private sector. And the way to look at it is there are multiple ways to measure the cost of government spending. There's the diversion cost, which as I mentioned, uh, is the fact that resources, labor and capital are now being allocated by politicians in Washington instead of entrepreneurs in the private sector. There's the extraction cost, and that's simply the measure of how you finance that government spending, taxes and borrowing. They both have specific negative costs on your economy. Uh, but then there are all sorts of other, what I would call micro effect. The extraction and the diversion costs, they apply to every single penny of government spending. But then you have to realize not all government spending is the same. Uh, and the way public finance economists look at this is they break down government spending by different categories. There's basic rule of law and institutional spending. Uh, providing, uh, you know, at, well, providing the rule of law, the court system, and things like that. And those types of government spending are actually associated with good economic performance because government is creating the environment that allows those chefs in the private sector to mix labor and capital without worried about theft, expropriation, uh, invasion, and things like that. So core public goods of sound institutions, rule of law, and things like that, government spending on those things is associated with better economic performance. That's one category. Another category is physical and human capital. And this is sort of a mix. Uh, what are physical and human capital? Well, roads are an example of physical capital. What you guys are doing right here, getting an education, is an example of human capital. And those are things that we all understand that we need to have a good physical infrastructure network and we need to have an educated workforce to have a good growing economy. And these are things that governments generally do. Here's the problem, though. Governments usually do them very inefficiently. Uh, yes, the interstate highway system gave us a good return on our dollar, but building bridges to nowhere gives us a very bad return on our dollar. What do governments tend to do more of today? They tend to do more bridges to nowhere, earmarks, pork barrel spending. Uh, and so, so even though human capital spending can be associated with better economic performance, if politicians are misusing their appropriations authority, Physical capital spending is associated with wor worse economic performance. Human capital, another example. We spend more per capita than any country in the world other than Switzerland on education. And yet if you measure all the industrialized economies in the world, we have one of the worst performances. It turns out that our monopoly structure government school system uh, is extraordinarily expensive and gets us a very, very low rate of return in exchange. 
Uh, you look at countries like uh, the Netherlands, Germany, Sweden that have school choice systems. They spend a lot less. They get much, much better results per dollar or per euro or per kroner, whatever their unit of currency is. They're getting more bang for the buck. I mean, you know, and this, this is true for anything you do. Uh, depending on how good of a negotiator you are, you might go out and buy a new car for a great price. You may get ripped off. The problem with the way that government is providing physical and human capital, we're getting ripped off. We are paying a lot for all these things, and we're getting very, very poor results. So even though we know that physical and human capital spending are very important for an economy, the question is, how efficient is the government at providing them? So that's, that's the second category. First category, uh, institutions. Second category, physical and human capital. Then there are two other categories, transfer spending and consumption spending. And this is actually the vast majority of what government does, or at least what the federal government does. And all the academic research pretty much indicates that this type of spending is negatively associated with economic performance. Uh, because this is the type of spending that tells people, don't work as much, the government will replace that income. Don't save and invest as much, the government will take care of you. Uh, this is the type of spending that has the inefficiency, the dependency. You also have spending on things like regulatory agencies. I mean, our, our budget for the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, I think, is less than a billion dollars. Uh, but the cost of just one law alone, Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, was like one and a half billion dollars, and that was just on one segment of the business community. So the amount of money we actually spend on a regulatory agency is trivial often to the amount of cost that that regulatory agency might be imposing on the economy. Now then, of course, you have to remember our discussion on regulation. You need to figure out, is the regulation efficient, inefficient, the cost-benefit structure, so on and so forth. And when you look at all these issues of government spending, one thing you find is there's something in the academic literature called the Ron curve. It's sort of like the, this, I'll talk a little bit later about the Laffer curve. This is the spending version of the Laffer curve. It says if government isn't providing any, isn't spending anything, and isn't providing that rule of law, isn't providing infrastructure, human and physical capital, then you're going to have a very weak economy. So you need some government spending to enable your economy to grow, but then when government gets too big, then it bends downward and more spending is asso associated with weaker economic performance. Uh, and, all, and, and I think the data is that at most, uh, total government spending in your economy, once it exceeds 20% of GDP, uh, it begins to be negatively related to prosperity. Right now, federal, state, and local work close to 40%. And I actually think the, the accurate data is more like 10% of GDP. We don't really have time to get into that because I can see uh, we're running out. So I'm going to go quickly through a few other points. Keynesianism, stimulus. Uh, here's the theory. Divide the class in half. Borrow all the money from people on this half of the room. Give it to people on this half of the room. Here's a question to determine whether you're qualified to be a member of Congress. Who thinks there's more money in the room? Nobody, nobody raised their hand. Uh, you're, you're not qualified to be in the cabinet or to be in Washington at all. Keynesianism is the theory that you take money out of the right pocket of your economy, put it in the left pocket of your economy, and you're richer as a result. It doesn't work. It didn't work for Hoover and Roosevelt in the 30s. It didn't work for, uh, for the Japan in the 1990s. It didn't work for Bush in 2008. It didn't work for Obama in 2009. Uh, Keynesianism is simply an excuse that the politicians have come up with, I think, uh, to enable them to do what they like doing anyhow, which is to spend money. Let's talk about taxes and try to do it all in just a few minutes here. Uh, the ideal tax system, remember I said that not all government spending is created equal? It's the same thing for taxes. Not all taxes are created equal. Do you realize that the Hong Kong flat tax Create, uh, collects roughly the same amount of money as a share of GDP as the US tax code. And yet, obviously, the Hong Kong flat tax is much less destructive to growth than the US Internal Revenue Code. Hong Kong, nice, simple 15 or 16% flat tax. The entire tax code is less than 200 pages. We have this monstrosity of an Internal Revenue Code, 72,000 pages of law and regulation. We have pervasive double taxation between the capital gains tax corporate income tax, double tax on dividends, and the death tax, a single dollar of income, can be taxed four different times. Good public finance theory says that for any given amount of revenue you want to collect, you should have your rate as low as possible. You should not be double taxing savings and investment, because every single economic theory, even socialism, socialism and Marxism, they all agree that capital formation, 
you know, again, we're back to that, the chef mixing capital and labor. If you don't have capital, labor is not going to be productive, and that's what determines the health, the prosperity, the vitality of your economy. And yet, our tax system goes out of its way to penalize the provision of capital to the economy, almost as if we were deliberately designing a tax code to reduce our long-term growth rate. Uh, so we have this pervasive double taxation, and then that 72,000 pages of law and regulation, that's because we have a plethora, an array, a monstrosity, a Rube Goldberg system of loopholes, exemptions, exclusions, deductions, credits, shelters, so on and so forth, that winds up putting industrial policy into our system. In other words, the government, through the tax code, is being the chef trying to determine how labor and capital get allocated, and that necessarily means a less uh, dynamic, less vital economy. And if you fix all the problems in the tax code, where you have the lowest possible rate, when you get rid of the double taxation, you get rid of the loopholes, what do you have? You have a flat tax. Or, to be more accurate, you have a single rate consumption-based tax system. Now, when public finance economists refer to consumption-based tax systems, they're really just referring to a tax system where income is taxed only one time. Uh, that's the consumption-based, sometimes called fisher ture tax base. The other model of taxation, which unfortunately that we follow for the most part in Washington, is called the hague simons tax base. And that's the principle that not only do you tax income, but you tax net worth as well. You, you tax changes in net worth. You tax transfers of net worth. Uh, you, and that's where all the double taxation, or a lot of the double taxation in the tax code exists. Uh, so if you want the right type of tax system where you collect revenue while doing the least amount of damage to the economy, a consumption-based tax system with a low rate is much better than a hague simons system of double taxation with high rates. Now this, of course, gets into issues like fairness. Uh, and fairness, like beauty, is in the eye of the beholder. Does fairness mean that you treat everyone equally? Or does fairness mean that you impose higher tax rates on people who are providing more output for the economy? There's a cost. If you decide to go with that latter definition of fairness, it means you are going to penalize the entrepreneurs, the investors, the people who tend to have the most bang for the buck. For every hour of labor they provide to the economy, they generate a much, much bigger amount of output. You know, that's the value of marginal product in your labor economics classes. That's what determines how much your salary and wages are going to be in the long run, is how productive are you uh, per hour worked? How much wealth can you generate for an economy? Uh, now let me touch on a few other ideas about the, we talked about the theory of taxes. I mentioned the Laffer curve before. This is simply the notion that tax rates at some point can become so high that they're self-defeating. Uh, and let me give you an example. And of course, the theory, uh, let me first give you the theory. At a 0% tax rate, how much money does the government collect? Nothing. At a 100% tax rate, how much money does the government collect? Nothing. Well, maybe there are a few genetic socialists out there who would still earn income if the government took 100% of it. But for the most part, 100% tax rate, no revenue for government. 0% tax rate, no revenue for government. Paul Krugman will agree with that. The real debate is, OK, where is that point on the Laffer curve? Uh, where you have a revenue maximizing point, but more importantly, you also have a growth maximizing point. I don't want to maximize revenue for government. So I've never looked at the Laffer curve and thought, well, boy, if we could just have the tax rate exactly at this point, we could give those people in Washington the most possible amount of money to spend. But that's never been high, it's never even been low on my list of priorities to give them the maximum amount of money to spend. The growth maximizing tax rate, in effect, automatically comes from your look at the Ron curve and figuring out what is the growth maximizing size of government. If the growth maximizing size of government is 10% of GDP, then you necessarily flow down to your Laffer curve and you figure out what is the least destructive way of collecting taxes of 10% of GDP. Or maybe you think it's 20% of GDP. Maybe you think it's 5% of GDP. But you make your decision on what should government do and of course, secondary to that, you figure out what level of government should do it. If you want to honor what the Founding Fathers had in mind, you have a very limited central government, which for much of our nation's history, the federal government only consumed 3% of GDP. Most government was then at the state and local level, and so you'd have a separate decision. How does the federal government collect revenue? How do state and local governments collect revenue? But in both cases, you presumably want them to decide how can we collect revenues in a way that doesn't damage the economy? A couple of other issues that I want to touch on really fast. Uh, one is the issue of Starve the Beast. 
Uh, there's a big debate in Washington right now about whether taxes should be increased. We have this big pile of red ink. Uh, you can look at the data and you can see the reason that we have all this red ink is because government spending under Bush and Obama has exploded. Uh, if you look at taxes as a share of GDP, even without any tax increases, uh, we're going to be above that historical average on the federal level of 18% of GDP. So I think there's a very strong argument that 100% of the problem is on the spending side, so why on earth would you, you want to have higher taxes? But then separate from that is the issue that if you decide to raise taxes, is that even capable of reducing the deficit? Because if it turns out that when you raise taxes, you simply encourage the politicians to spend more money, sort of the old joke about you don't give the keys to a liquor store to a bunch of alcoholics, then it turns out that raising taxes might actually make the fiscal situation worse, in part because they spend more money, but in part because of the Laffer curve effects. Oh, we're going to raise taxes because we want more money, so we'll, we'll increase the tax rate this much. We think we'll get this much money, but in reality, you only get this much money, but they spent this much money because of the expectation of getting this much money. That's why if you look at the situation in Europe, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, the burden of government in Europe was similar to what it was in the US. They kept raising taxes. They kept raising spending. And this is, this is sort of the starve the beast, feed the beast theory. Do, do, does cutting taxes reduce the size of government? Well, during the Bush years, the answer is definitely no. So I wouldn't want to really argue strongly that starve the beast worked. But the separate side of the argument is feed the beast. And the evidence from Europe is, is every time they increase tax rates, when they put in the value-added taxes, which is their sort of European form of, of a national sales tax, what happened? Well, before the VAT, before the tax burden went up, you had southern European economies with medium-sized governments and big deficits. You had northern European economies with medium-sized governments and small deficits. Now they all have much higher tax burdens. They all have value-added taxes. And what do you find? Southern European economies with big governments and big deficits, northern European economies with big governments and small deficits. All that's changed is they have higher taxes, which enabled, virtually speaking, a one-for-one -one trade off of higher spending. So, so how you come down on the starve the beast, feed the beast uh, debate will say a lot about whether or not you think it's appropriate to give the politicians in Washington more revenue. I mentioned the value added tax. That's going to be a giant fight in Washington. Maybe not one year or two years from now, but somewhere in the next five or ten years, there's going to be a major fight over whether we should have a value added tax. Uh, and that really determines, in my mind, whether or not the politicians will have a giant new source, broad-based source of revenue, just like when they put in the income tax in 1913, will they have another giant broad-based source of revenue that would enable us to sort of take that leap to the European level? Uh, now, whether that's a good leap or a bad leap depends on your underlying philosophy. Uh, I personally think that would be a very unfortunate leap because we certainly see uh, from what's happening in Europe now, why would we want to copy their fiscal policy? Uh, but, but the VAT, Here's what a lot of people think. The VAT, and this is true, on a per dollar raised basis, the VAT does less damage to your economy than higher income tax rates. And so if you have a pessimistic view of life, and you think, oh, no matter what, government's going to get bigger, uh, and they're holding a gun to my head, they, they're going to demand more money from me, what's the least damaging way to give them more money? Well, it would be to give them a VAT. But then you have to factor into that discussion, does giving them a VAT enable a much, much bigger size of government? And of course, what we saw in Europe is that when they did the VATs, they used that as an excuse to raise income tax rates anyhow, because they had to maintain the distribution of the tax burden, because they had the left-wing definition of fairness. Uh, one last thing, and then I'll, I'll be quiet, because we've run out of time. Uh, the current debate right now, just to bring everything we've talked about, the history, the theory, let's bring it all together to where the political process is right now in Washington. There's basically a fight between the kind of vision you have and the budget proposed by Congressman Paul Ryan, the chairman of the House Budget Committee, which, uh, which deals with fundamental reform of the entitlement programs. You look at the long run forecast for the US government, we're going to be Greece plus some because of demographics, and because of the way our entitlement programs are, are, uh, are, are structured. The long run forecast from the Congressional Budget Office is that government spending, and just to give you a little bit of numbers here, when Bill Clinton left office, federal government spending, the burden of that was 18.2% of GDP. Now we're 24% of GDP, a one third increase in the aggregate burden of government in just 11, 12 years. By the time we get several decades out with the baby boom generation fully retired, we're talking 45% of GDP, maybe more depending on which set of forecasts you believe. 
obviously, if you have a doubling in the size of government, uh, it means that we're going to be more like Italy, more like France, more like Spain, more like Greece, and that almost certainly is going to mean, because that chef of the, po of the political process is going to be much less efficient in terms of how they're allocating resources, how they're mixing labor and capital together, it's going to have very negative consequences on our GDP, our, on our employment levels, it's going to have ba very bad implications for the amount of red ink we have, it's going to have very bad implications for the type of tax system that we have, and you as students, and I suppose this is the, you know, a, a very pessimistic way to, to close uh, down my remarks, but you as students just entering the workforce in the next year or two or whenever, during your prime earning years are going to be precisely when we hit our period of Greek style fiscal crisis. So maybe you want to start buying property in New Zealand or Costa Rica or something like that. But, but if, if we don't make good decisions now, and this is why I was saying we have the budget prepared by the House Budget Committee Chairman Paul Ryan that restructures the entitlement programs. And then you have the vision of Bush and Obama of making government bigger, adding new entitlements. Uh, that vision basically, I think, puts us on a path to being Greece. But I want to be fair. It could also put us on the path to being Sweden. The Northern European economies do the welfare state in a much more responsible way. So it could be that if you want a welfare state, if that's where you ideologically are, then you better make sure that we wind up like Sweden, not like Greece. My personal fear is that our political system is much more likely to give us Greek-style results, not Swedish-style results. But if we happen to do the entitlement program reforms of a block granting Medicaid to the states, restructuring Medicare so it's like a voucher system like members of Congress have for their own health care. If we wind up doing personal retirement accounts for Social Security, like 30 plus countries around the world have done, then we can actually, this, this projection of ever rising burden of government spending, we can actually bend that cost curve of government down. And the one thing I'll leave you with, the one way that I think is very appropriate to measure what is good fiscal policy, is something that I very humbly named after myself. I call it Mitchell's Golden Rule. I want to sort of be like Art Laffer, he has the Laffer curve, I figure this is my way of becoming famous. Mitchell's golden rule is very simple. Government spending should grow slower than the private economy. Notice that I'm not focusing on balancing the budget. Notice that I'm not talking about deficits and debt. I'm focusing on the underlying disease, not the symptom. If I go to a doctor and I have a headache, and it turns out that I have a brain tumor, I don't want the doctor to give me aspirin for my headache. I want him to deal with the tumor because I want to actually solve the problem. Well, if you have an economy where the private sector is growing this fast and government's growing this fast, by the way, this right here is what's called a West Virginia PowerPoint slide. If the private economy is growing this fast, the government's growing this fast, sooner or later, it's a mathematical certainty, you will balance your budget, even though that shouldn't be your first priority. Your first priority should be making sure you have government as a small share of the economy. If those two lines are reversed, and government is growing faster than the private economy, sooner or later, it's a mathematical certainty, you become Greece. And that's really what our future is all about. Because there's no way your taxes can ever keep up with the spending if your spending is growing faster than the private economy. Because what's the private economy? It's your tax base. So Greece got in trouble, the rest of Europe's gotten in trouble, the US is on the path to trouble because we all suffer from the same problem of government growing faster than the private sector. We need to go back to Reagan and Clinton where those lines were reversed. The private economy was growing faster than the government. That is the path to virtue. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Mallory Factor. I'm your guide and host through the conservative intellectual tradition in America. And today we're talking about the end of big government. We have with us Professor and Dr. Daniel J. Mitchell. Um, we are thrilled to have him here, and we're going to be uh, taking some questions and answers about economics and how it affects the conservative tradition. First question. Yes, Mr. Selmaska. Uh, sir, with the failure of the Super Committee uh, some months ago, it kind of raises the specter of, you know, failed decision making or broken government. Um, my question is, is the deficit or the spending problem ever really going to be resolved? And if so, how? It depends how optimistic or pessimistic you are. Uh, there's a famous economist who's now passed away, Herb Stein, who uh, said if something can't go on forever, it won't. And obviously, we can't go on forever with spending going up at 8 to 10% a year, revenue going up at 3% a year. 
uh, because we'll wind up as Greece. And Greece learned just because the private credit markets wouldn't allow it to continue borrowing so much money. So sooner or later, that comes to an end. That's the, the wrong way for it to come to an end. You don't want to get into the situation where your economy is on the brink of a collapse. So in theory, what you want to do is figure out some way uh, to make the reforms of the entitlement programs, to put an overall cap on the growth of government spending, uh, make sure that the government, the burden of government spending is growing slower than the private economy grows. If you achieve that, government spending falls as a share of GDP, and automatically from that process, sooner or later, uh, you'll balance the budget and even go into budget surplus. That's uh, what happened in the 80s and 90s, uh, but under Bush and Obama, we've sort of had more of a Greek fiscal policy. The super committee, uh, I don't actually think it was a failure that they failed to agree because the only thing they would have agreed on is one of these phony Washington deals where you have real tax increases up front, promises of make-believe spending cuts in the future. So if they had come to an agreement, it would have been an agreement where they sort of papered over the problems, made government bigger, and we would have had more red ink. Just like in the 1990 budget deal, Bush's read my lips, the first President Bush, uh, that turned out to be a big disaster in terms of uh, fiscal policy. Uh, so the super committee basically had a no-win situation given the com composition of the committee. Uh, so I wasn't, I wasn't disappointed at all that they failed to come to an agreement because I think that saved taxpayers from a, from a bad package. Dan, you talked about four key factors before rule of law, tr uh, monetary policy, regulation, fiscal policy, and trade. You talked about the need and almost the consensus of the need for free trade. But I hear something, um, a word thrown around in Washington called fair trade and dumping and protectionism is necessary against that. Um, is there a difference between fair trade and free trade? And should we, should we really be for fair trade and against classical free trade? Well, I define classical free trade as fair trade. Uh, when I say there's a consensus for free trade, that doesn't mean unanimity. It doesn't mean that we have a free trade system ourselves. Uh, Hong Kong, I guess, would be the closest to a true uh, free trade uh, jurisdiction in the world, although obviously we have basically free trade among uh, the states. So, uh, and the European Union, for all its warts, at least is a free trade area. So that's a positive feature uh, of that, uh, of that uh, political entity. Uh, when you hear talk about and demands for some form of protectionism, fair trade, anti-dumping duties, and things like that, that I think is a rear guard action uh, by people who don't like free trade, usually for narrow parochial interests, mm -hmm. and they're basically trying to sort of arrest and halt the trend toward free trade. Uh, you know, I guess it's just like you know, the Germans had the Battle of the Bulge in World War II. You know, they, had, you know, they were losing, but they had a short-term retrenchment where they won back a little bit of territory, but it didn't change the fact that it was not a, uh, you know, they were losing the war. And likewise, I think the protectionists are losing the war, but they may win an occasional battle uh, with some of these anti-dumping rules and different provisions like that. Uh, so it's a... So you have to no the extent you there have, is a consensus, yeah. I think free trade is the consensus, even though it's not perfect. So you have no problem with, with, with dumping then? Oh, no. I, well, it de depends on how you define dumping. Uh, is it possible for a foreign country to deliberately subsidize, uh, in the proper sense and understanding of the word, to deliberately subsidize the selling of goods into the U.S. market in a way that isn't really free markets and free trade? Of course that's possible. Uh, I suspect, and I'm, I'm not a fiscal policy person, not a trade person, so I'm not going to pretend to have a, mm -hmm. every factoid on the tip of my tongue, but I suspect that most anti-dumping duties, or most anti-dumping cases that are bought by U.S. manufacturers, what they're really complaining about is that foreign manufacturers have figured out lower cost ways of producing something. Uh, so it's not, it's not actually dumping, it's just, oh, they're more competitive and efficient than I am and I don't like it and I'm going to try to use uh, the anti-dumping rules to try to stop this bit of free trade. Well, I guess on the other side of it, if somebody wants to sell us uh, iPads and uh, iPods for paper, our paper uh, meaning our, our, our debt, um, isn't that a good deal? Just, just give them paper if they're going to give us iPods and iPads, regardless if there's dumping. Uh, well, that, that's one of the arguments. If foreign governments want to subsidize U.S. consumers, why should we object to it? We should say thank you very much. Uh, and that's, that's true, uh, although uh, 
I still don't like it because it is a distortion. It is, it is the politician acting as a chef determining the allocation of labor and capital. And it, it does, in that case, unnecessarily and unfairly penalize American producers and the workers in those firms. I mean, if a foreign company and foreign workers have figured out a better way of producing a, a certain good, uh, and I happen to be a shareholder, a worker, an executive with one of those companies, then at least I've lost a fair battle. It's like I'm in a race, the other person trains harder, has more natural ability, they win the race against me. I know I tried my best, I know I tried my hardest, but I lost fairly. I wouldn't really like it if they got to start on the 10-yard line and I had to start on the 0-yard line, uh, even though it might actually be good for me that they got to the finish line first, if we use the trade analogy, because they'd be subsidizing uh, my consumption. But uh, uh, I, I do want free trade to be free trade. The problem is, even if there is genuine dumping, uh, which means that another country is shooting its taxpayers in the foot, does it ever make sense for us to shoot our taxpayers in the foot to compensate? I mean, if you're doing something wrong, if you're, you know, your parents certainly at some point said, oh, come on, Mallory, if your friend said jump off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge? Well, you know, this is really what protectionism is all about. Just because, just because your friend or neighbor is doing something wrong, okay, hey, try some heroin with me. Hopefully you're going to have the brains to say, no, thank you, I'm not going to try that heroin. I'm not going to try that protectionism because even though you're doing the wrong thing, it would just make matters worse if I did the wrong thing as well. So I guess the conservative position um, is free trade, period. The conservative position is free trade, period, but we don't really have pure free trade. What we have is a managed form of free trade through things like the WTO. Now, what is the WTO, World Trade Organization? It's a dispute resolution mechanism that allows countries uh, in a theoretical neutral environment for providing that rule of law uh, to say, oh, that country actually is doing something protectionist. Uh, the World Trade Organization does a finding. Yes, you are being protectionist. You have to stop it, or if you don't stop it, then you have these countervailing uh, penalties against you. And that process, I think, has been relatively, you know, nothing government ever does works perfectly. Uh, everything is always, it takes three times as long and it's five times as expensive to get there as it should be. But the WTO process, and, and before that, the GATT trade liberalization, you know, the GATT rounds, mm -hmm. you know, the Uruguay rounds, the Doha, you know, all this trade liberalization in the post-World War II era, I think has made a big difference in the prosperity of the world economy. Again, look at the economic freedom of the world index. Trade is 20% of what determines a nation's prosperity. So if you have more free trade, and that certainly has been true for almost every nation in the world in the last 50 to 60 years moving in that direction, I think that's been very helpful for the world economy. Next question. Yes, sir. To what extent has the devaluation of the Chinese uh, currency, you think, played in part to become a trade barrier to U.S. goods being imported into China? Uh, that's, a, that's a very challenging question because it, it probably is true, at least from the people I talk to who I respect. I'm not a monetary economist, so this, will, again, will be something where I'm, a, I'm a, going to... A, uh, not be able to get into too great of a details, but the people I talk to who know these issues say yes, in all likelihood, not really for trade reasons, but for domestic uh, political reasons, the Chinese are keeping their currency artificially at a certain level in order to promote more domestic employment, in order to try to maintain a certain domestic tranquility, because the one thing that terrifies China's leaders is instability, uncertainty in the population. They've had riots. They, and, and they're terrified of another Tiananmen Square type situation. So they want to keep people happy, and that means to keep them employed. And, and so they do have this form of interventionism uh, designed to help their export-oriented industries. I don't think that's the right policy. Uh, but I don't think it's being done because they're trying to maintain a certain trade balance with the U.S. I think that's a consequence of what they're doing for domestic political reasons. It's unfortunate because there should be genuine free trade between the U.S. and China. Uh, now, of course, there are other issues as well, which is that certain industries are really government-favored industries with the princelings of the party bosses running them, and, and they're getting favorable capital. And, and you can get into very complicated arguments about, you know, can you have genuinely free trade with an economy that has a lot of state control of the allocation of credit and capital? Uh, but this brings us back to the previous question. If China's doing the wrong thing, and arguably they are in certain ways, that doesn't mean that we should do the wrong thing too. If they're impoverishing their people as part of a, of a misguided export-led strategy, we shouldn't penalize and impoverish our people 
uh, using the same mentality. We, instead, we should try to work with them through these dispute resolution mechanisms uh, to uh, you know, moral suasion, browbeating, whatever you want to call it. We should try to push them in the right direction. And I think over time, that is somewhat successful in getting countries to do the right thing. Because again, that's, that's the area where I think consensus is very strong in the world. Next question. Uh, Mr. Mellon, Cadet Mellon. Uh, how similar is China's devaluation of their currency to our own quantitative easing that we've had? Uh, I suppose in its consequences, it might be somewhat similar, but in terms of what's driving it, it's completely different. Uh, when we have what's called quantitative easing, it's, uh, it's being done, this might be a little bit unfair, but being done for Keynesian reasons. Uh, Keynesian economics on the fiscal side is all about deficit spending. Keynesian economics on the monetary side is all about uh, artificial easing, trying to artificially reduce interest rates because in, you're, in theory you're going to stimulate more investment because the cost of capital is low. So when we do something like quantitative easing in the U.S., uh, it's for a completely different reason. And so even though in both cases the economies in theory, are, are having easy money. Uh, it's so different in terms of the intent that I, I don't think they're really analogous. Now, you mentioned Keynes quite a bit uh, in, in your talk, in, in your lecture. Um, are, is Keynes really being discredited by the conservatives, or, or do they believe that, that, that there is a, a serious value to Keynesian economics? Uh, I think it's fair to say that that Keynesians today are the ones who are discrediting Keynes because they're taking a few insights uh, that Keynes made and they've taken them to an illogical extreme. Uh, Keynes himself uh, made comments about how government should never be more than 25% of GDP and obviously in the U.S. we're close to 40% of GDP and some European countries are more than 50% of GDP. Uh, and I think also even though I would disagree with, with the underlying mechanics of how Keynesianism is described, there's no question in my mind that, that if you were to reduce government spending in the economy, there might be a transitional cost of resources being redeployed to the private sector. You know, you don't, if you, if you fire a bureaucrat at some useless government agency, they're probably not going to get a great job overnight. So there might be a transitional period of labor and capital as they sort of instead of being misallocated by the government, it might take six months or a year for those resources to then be productively picked up and utilized by the private sector. So it could very well be, uh, and I, I certainly would not pretend uh, to say what did Keynes really mean by X, Y, and Z, and, and by and large I think modern Keynesians do have him right in the sense that he really was about aggregate demand uh, and things like that, but, but part of Keynesianism in terms of the dislocation of shifting from a government economy to a private economy, uh, there might be a little bit of truth in Keynesianism there that uh, maybe conservatives uh, wouldn't be too ready to acknowledge because that's just the way politics works. So, so by, I guess what you're saying is that the Keynes, I mean Keynes himself and, and his writings um, the conservative establishment really isn't against. It's the Keynesians, the modern Keynesians, that have kind of taken, well, picked I, I, and, ch and chose a few, a few little pieces of it, and, and that actually is, 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 is what the supply-siders are very much against. Yes, but, but I would say that modern conservative supply-siders, Austrian school people, however you want to describe it, modern people on the right would not want to accept the aggregate demand analysis mm -hmm. that comes out of Keynes. So that part there would still be a fundamental disagreement on. Uh, you know, Keynes himself, I, mean, I, I, I think, uh, if I remember my, uh, my economics from 25, 30 years ago correctly, you know, Keynes himself was the one, or maybe it was one of the, his uh, acolytes, you know, said that, yes, if all you're doing is hiring people to dig holes and fill them in again, that's a good way for government to stimulate the economy. And so, so that part of Keynesian, which is definitely at least first generation Keynesian economists, that part I don't think would ever and never will be accepted uh, by, uh, by people on the right, the pro-free market people. Even though, again, we want to recognize that Keynes himself 
was in many ways a traditional market-oriented economist who did not like protectionism, did not like regulation, thought that high tax rates were damaging. But he did think if the economy hit a speed bump, that government could come in and spend a bunch of money and sort of be like priming the pump, to sort of, you know, you know, sort of like picking the bicycle back up, pushing it, and then, you know, then it has enough momentum to keep going on itself. So that part of Keynesianism that still exists today, I think, is an accurate reflection of, of Keynes. And that part, you would still have and always will have people like me disagreeing with. But even if you're a Keynesian, don't you believe that there's some point where you have to stop priming it? Yes, and, that, and that's why the politicians definitely priming that uh, pump that is are, are, a proverbial yeah, pump because in, in theory again you're just priming the pump or you're picking the bicycle up and just giving it some momentum it's like when you're teaching your kid to ride a bike once you sort of push it and they begin pedaling themselves they're okay the problem is politicians because they like spending money and in this case in the analogy the politician spending money is holding onto the bike and pushing it they'll just continue to do it and do it and do it at, whereas in Keynesian theory, you're supposed to run a surplus in the good times to compensate for the deficits that you use to s allegedly stimulate mm -hmm. the economy in the bad times. Next question. Um, Mr. Lacey. We've talked a lot about the federal government. What role do the states have to play in this? I mean, even if we went to the 15% flat tax or whatever, then there's still you know state income taxes, state property taxes, state sales taxes all on top of that. Um, and same if the federal government were to cut certain spending things such as highway projects, doesn't that then just get pushed onto the states to come out of their taxes? Where do they play in? Historically, up until the New Deal, uh, we had, uh, and outside of wartime, uh, we had a federal government about 3% of GDP, and then when you added in state and local spending, that was another 6 or 7% of GDP, and that was the total burden of government spending. Now we have a federal government at almost 25% of GDP, and state and local government spending about, I don't know, 13, 14 percent of GDP. Uh, so if we shrank the federal government, that doesn't necessar necessarily mean that state and local government spending should pick up the slack because a lot of what government does shouldn't exist at any level of government. Uh, uh, you should, uh, you, and again, historically, the federal government would concentrate on things like national defense, and state and local governments would do things like physical and human capital. Uh, but for much of our nation's history, up until the 1930s, there, there was no transfer spending, consumption spending, welfare spending, things like that. Uh, and those were things that historically had been in the private sector, charitable associations, religious institutions, and things like that. Uh, but one of the beauties of a federal system, if we shrink the federal government back down to what the founding fathers envisioned, if a state like California wanted to have a big welfare state, God bless them, go ahead, put in that big welfare state. In all likelihood, you would see a migration, matter of fact, we already do see this, you see a migration of labor and capital, jobs and investment from those high tax states like California, Greece, Illinois, and New York. Uh, they'd be moving to the zero income tax states like Florida and Texas and Tennessee and South Dakota and Nevada. Uh, but that's good because that's innovation, that's diversity, that's competition among the states. Uh, and I think that's a much, much healthier approach uh, the one country that has federalism, matter of fact, it's been known as America's sister republic, is Switzerland. Switzerland is still doing it right, not completely, but they have 70% of government at the canton and municipal level, whereas we have 70% of government at the national level. Uh, and it used to be we were like Switzerland. And even Switzerland was allowing too much government at the central government level. Uh, but Switzerland has preserved its federal structure, and I think that's one of the reasons why Switzerland uh, has been much more... Uh, historically has been one of the most successful and richest economies in the world. I'm Cadet Slater. During uh, the Clinton administration, the uh, deficit was decreased in part due to the line item veto. What do you think, uh, in terms of like cost-benefit analysis of that, is the cost of liberty worth the benefit of decreasing spending? Uh, well, I view those as both good things. Increasing liberty and decreasing spending uh, are sort of different sides of the same coin. You decrease spending, you're reducing the government's control over the economy, you're reducing the government's role as an allocator of resources, and you're giving people the liberty, the freedom, to decide uh, how they're going to earn their income, how they're going to spend their income, how they're going to live their lives. Um, you mentioned the Clinton administration. Uh, I don't know that uh, there was some small form of line item veto in there at some point, if I recall correctly, but I don't think that played a major role uh, to whatever degree it was. What really happened during the Clinton years is that, is that we satisfied uh, my narcissistically named Mitchell's golden rule, 
because during the Clinton years, government spending uh, grew by only about 4% a year. And actually, during the four-year period between 94 and 98, it grew by less than 3% a year. And when your nominal GDP is growing by 6 or 7% a year, and government spending is only growing 3 to 4% a year, uh, you very quickly get, you, you improve your fiscal status every single year. Uh, and that's why we went from big deficits to big surpluses. We even had a big tax cut in 1997, and it was the following year that we got the first surplus, I think it was. Uh, so, so good policy feeds upon itself. Uh, and the number one thing to focus on, as I said, make sure government spending is growing slower than the economy. If government spending is growing slower than the economy, you get balanced budgets, you can be cutting taxes, but more importantly, you are leaving more resources in the productive sector of the economy, not under the control of politicians, uh, and that's going to be much more efficient and productive for your economy. On uh, Next question, uh, Cadet Faust. Um, <clears throat> during the lesson, you mentioned two things. Uh, you mentioned Star of the Beast. And you, and, which I think is a really interesting concept, but you also met, you also said during your during the lesson that debt is not the problem; it's a symptom. But many people would say that debt is the problem, because what it ends up happening is is that debt allows the government to grow. It used to be that before we start taking on so much debt, the people had some control over the size of the government. If you wanted big government, you had to pay for it. What's ended up happening is that we've taken on more and more debt, and we're feeling it now, and people don't have to pay for it. We can have low taxes and have a large government, which is one of the arguments that a lot of people would say to go back to the gold standard to really discourage taking on so much debt. Uh, no, that, that's a very good question. The, uh, the late chairman, uh, recently passed away, Bill Niskanen, late chairman of the Cato Institute, uh, uh, he was a big proponent of that. We used to argue in the hallways all the time. What he said was that if you make people pay 100% of the cost of government, they're going to demand less government, sort of supply and demand. If something goes up in price, you're going to want less of it. So if we wind up having to pay 100 cents on the dollar for government rather than 80 cents on the dollar for government, we're going to want less government. My response to Bill was, here's the problem. The people paying for the government are not the same ones who are benefiting from the government. You basically have the top 20% of the population uh, paying something like, you know, depending on how you measure it, you know, two-thirds, four-fifths uh, of, the, of the tax burden. And then it's the bottom 50% that are collecting all the government benefits. So if you wind up making the top 20% pay 100 cents on the dollar, you're not really changing the demand for government because the demand for government is from all the non-taxpayers in the economy. Now, of course, there is overlap of taxpayers and tax consumers, and so it, it gets complicated. But I, but I, don't, think, uh, I don't think Bill's theory holds because we have moved into a, into a system where the people who pay the taxes, there's, a, there's a, a sufficiently large gap between the people who pay the taxes and the people who demand the government. Uh, and so simply making the, that 20% pay even more isn't going to change the underlying demand for government at all. Uh, and I think uh, what's happened in Europe, I think it's, it's pretty good empirical evidence uh, for my position. Now, contrary to that, and Bill certainly said this many times, well, look at Bush. He reduced taxes. Reducing taxes did not starve the beast because they just increased government spending anymore, uh, even more. Uh, but I think what that shows us is that politicians just like to spend money. Whether taxes are going up, they like to spend money. If taxes are going down, they like to spend money. The real problem is what can you do to somehow put a cap on the overall level of spending? Uh, now, it used to be during the Reagan years, we thought that deficits acted as a check because politicians wouldn't let deficits get above a certain level, and that meant that if you, know, if you didn't let them raise taxes and the deficits were already at 4% of GDP, that was the maximum sustainable deficit. That meant they had to control spending. Well, now, for several years, we've had 9 10% of GDP deficits. Now, maybe 9 to 10% is the new 4%. Uh, and so if you don't let them raise taxes, they can only borrow up to 9 or 10% of GDP, and that in and of itself is a limit on spending. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I just know that, that raising taxes, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer, don't feed the beast. I'm not a big believer that starve the beast will work. You talked um, a, a little bit about a flat tax, and you also talked a little bit about a value-added tax or a VAT tax or some kind of a... Uh, sales, a national sales tax. Um, is, wouldn't a national sales tax be a lot better for the economy than the income tax we have today, um, where we're taxing uh, productivity as opposed to taxing consumption? 
Well, remember during my presentation, I said, what is the theoretically ideal tax system? It's a low rate consumption based tax. And it actually turns out there are several ways to skin that cat. A flat tax taxes your income one time at one low rate when you earn it. A national sales tax taxes your income one time at one low rate when you spend it. But in theory, a national retail sales tax, like the fair tax some of you may have heard about, a value added tax, assuming it's a replacement for the current system, is an example. A flat tax is an example. These are all different sides of the same coin. Low rate, single rate, consumption based tax systems. And they all stand in contrast to the current Internal Revenue Code, which has the high discriminatory rates. It has the pervasive double taxation of income that's saved and invested. It's riddled with loopholes and corruption and things like that. So really the question is, if you don't like the current system we have right now, and pretty much nobody does other than the lobbyists, uh, if you don't like the current system we have right now, what is the best replacement system for it? And that's a political judgment. Most of my work on this issue has been on the flat tax. Why? Because I'm a pessimist. And what does that have to do with anything? Because if you do a flat tax, what's the worst thing that can happen? Well, you degenerate back to the current system. Uh, that's obviously not good news, uh, but at least you know what you're going to get. What's the worst thing that can happen if you go with a national retail sales tax or a value added tax? Well, the worst thing that can happen is the politicians will lie to you, which pretty much is whenever their lips are moving. And it turns out that instead of replacing the income tax with a value added tax or a national retail sales tax, they keep the income tax, which is what every single country that's ever adopted a VAT has done. None of them have ever gotten rid of the income tax in exchange. So they promise you, we're going to do something to get rid of the income tax. We're going to give the government this giant new source of revenue. Uh, but then they keep the income tax and you then have this money machine for much, much bigger government and you wind up being Greece. Uh, so if I have a choice between a flat tax, where the worst thing that happens is we become what we are now, or we do a retail sales tax or a VAT, and the worst thing that happens is we become France, well, I don't want to become France. Simple as that. Uh, next question. Cadet Salmaska. Uh, sir, suppose our, uh, our spending problem, our deficit problem, doesn't get resolved. We keep heading down the same uh, path that we are um, today. What are some of the real, tangible, everyday consequences that we're eventually going to have to deal with? Well, sooner or later, you do wind up with a fiscal crisis. And the fiscal crisis is debt-related. But the reason you get into that, that debt-related fiscal crisis is because you have decades of overspending, overspending, overspending uh, that gets you into the mess. Think of the economy left to its own devices as an athlete. And that athlete can, can just run mile after mile at five and a half minutes a mile. Well, you take that athlete, you put, give him a backpack with a couple of bricks. Maybe he's going to run those miles at six minutes. Then you put a couple more bricks in the backpack, he's running a seven minute mile. Then all of a sudden you throw a couple of cinder blocks in, he's running nine minute miles. And then you make him drag an anchor and he's running you know, 40 minute miles. Uh, that's sort of what big government does. It, as it gets bigger and bigger, and it's not, we're not just talking spending, it could be the regulatory burden and other things sort of you know, adding to the mix, you are slowing down uh, a process that, that left alone would normally be very efficient and productive. Uh, and, and so big government slows down growth. That's why you see high growth rates of 5 or 6% in Hong Kong and Singapore over time. You see these medium growth rates in the U.S. of 3% over time. But then in these very big welfare states in Europe, you see these 1%, 2% growth rates over time. The athlete is carrying a medium backpack in the U.S. Uh, and a big backpack in Europe. Uh, and what happens when you get to the fiscal crisis, I don't know, I've never thought about expanding this analogy, but if, uh, you, you're running that 40-minute mile dragging the anchor, then all of a sudden a sniper hits you in the thigh. Well, guess what? I don't know, maybe you're running your, you know, five week miles then, uh, you know, and you get, you get to the stage where the government, where private investors don't trust to lend you money anymore, or if they lend you money, they're demanding, you know, 25, 30% interest rates. I mean, you just get to a point where you've spent yourself into such a ditch that, uh, 
that, that all of a sudden you just can't support the system anymore. And it goes beyond just economics. It goes into cultural and moral and philosophical things. You only get to that stage when you have so many people in your society riding in the wagon and only a minority of people pulling the wagon. And when, when those people pulling the wagon just can't pull it anymore, the wagon stops. The people riding in the wagon have been lured into decades of government dependency. They don't know how to produce anymore. They don't know how to be honest participants in a market economy anymore. Uh, then you descend into some Mad Max dystopia. Uh, you know, and, and, and God knows what would be happening in a country like Greece if it wasn't for the bailouts. I don't think they should get the bailouts because I think they should learn what happens. And what they would learn, they would learn what happens is that you can't treat the people pulling the wagon like they're your slaves. And that's what happens with big government and welfare states. Everybody who's mooching off the government, whether they're getting welfare benefits, retirement benefits, whether they're government bureaucrats padding a payroll, all these people who are riding in the wagon better make sure to respect and treat at least semi-decently the people pulling the wagon because think about it this way. You're a parasite, you want a healthy host. If you're a flea, you don't want the dog that you're on to die. And that's what's happening in Greece is they've gotten to the point where so many fleas are sucking so much life out of the dog that the dog's dying. And the stupid European taxpayers are saying, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll send some more puppies for you to feast on, but you have to promise that, that the fleas are gonna learn how to, uh, how to actually you know, live on their own. Uh, I, I wonder, I don't think that's gonna be very successful, uh, but, but that's, that's frankly what you get to. It, it really is a ratio of the people who are dependent and mooching off government versus the people who are producing. And if that ratio gets too out of whack with the, uh, with the moochers and the looters outnumbering the producers, you're, you're dead unless you find somebody to bail you out. And the problem is by the time we get to the stage when the U.S. is in trouble, there's not going to be anybody there to bail us out. Let's take a look at some of the presidents, um, current and, and past presidents. Which were the true economic conservatives, the ones who believed in smaller government and um, the rule of law, trade, monetary policy, regulation, and physical policy that was healthy. Could, could you kind of go through the well, current one and, and, and go back a few? Well, uh, it's probably easier to say who was good. Uh, okay. And uh, in my lifetime, uh, uh, Reagan would rank first, Clinton and JFK would somehow be second or third, then everyone else would just be bad. Uh, if we looked at the last century, Coolidge might rank even above Reagan. Uh, um, Roosevelt and Johnson would probably be, uh, and Hoover would be the three worst. Uh, both Bushes were very disappointing. Obama is very disappointing. Uh, Nixon was terrible. Uh, um, Eisenhower, I think, just punched the clock. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's mostly a rogues gallery. Why was Bush so terrible? Well, I mean, we, we know why Obama was so terrible. But, I mean, wasn't Bush's need for um, increasing the size of government um, basically a military issue, increasing the size of the military? Uh, I mentioned uh, during my remarks that uh, when Bill Clinton left office, the burden of federal spending was 18.2% of GDP. Now it's 24% of GDP. Uh, less than one and a half percentage points of that was uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, Homeland Security, and things like that. The vast majority of this huge expansion of the burden of government spending that we've had in the last 11, 12 years uh, well, basically began Bush's first year with the no bureaucrat left behind education bill, the, the corrupt farm bills, the pork filled transportation bills, the Medicare uh, prescription drug entitlement, uh, the bailouts, Obama comes in, does his own bailouts, does the, uh, uh, Bush had his 2008 stimulus, uh, Obama had his 2009 stimulus, both of which were failed Keynesian experiments, then we got Obamacare. I mean, you know, it, it doesn't matter whether you have an R or a D after your name. You make government bigger, uh, the economy weakens. You make government smaller, like Reagan and Clinton did, the economy does better. And again, it's more than just, I'm, I'm focusing on fiscal policy because that's my bailiwick. Uh, but you look at things like regulation, you know, you, uh, under Obama you have the Dodd-Frank bailout bill, but under Bush you had Fannie and Freddie and you had the Sarbanes-Oxley. You know, they, they were both uh, easy money uh, presidents. Uh, whereas uh, you know, Reagan was much more about, uh, okay, bite the bullet, let's get the inflation out of the system. He was, had the courage to uh, suffer some short-term pain to put America in a better uh, long-term position. Uh, but, but most presidents and most politicians 
uh, they focus just on the next, their, their time horizon is the next election cycle. And I think that's a lot of what drove bad policy under Bush. I, I, I was always in during the Bush years meeting with people at Treasury, Office of Management and Budget, Council of Economic Advisors, National Economic uh, Council, uh, Treasury Department, you name it. And I'd say, you know, in a nutshell, to sum up the dozens and dozens of meetings I had, what the blank are you guys doing? And universally, the answer was, it's not our blanking fault. Uh, all these bad decisions are being made by the political people in the White House. In other words, the economists working for the Bush administration knew that all the spending was bad, knew that all the regulation was bad, uh, uh, but they said it's out of our control because basically Karl Rove is convincing Bush, or maybe Bush thought this himself, that, oh, the way you be compassionate is that you spend other people's money. Next question, uh, Cadet Mellon. Uh, how has Sweden not fallen off into your proverbial uh, Mad Max utopia yet with its welfare state and now uh, large dependence on the uh, whole world economy? Uh, if you look at the Economic Freedom of the World Index, or the Index of Economic Freedom, and remember that there are five different categories. There's a monetary policy, rule of law, uh, trade policy, uh, regulatory policy, and fiscal policy. I think those are the five. Maybe I said one twice, but uh, um, Sweden gets a very bad grade on sides of government, but they get very, very good grades in every other category. Same for Denmark, same for Finland, same you know, to a slightly lesser extent for Norway and Germany and uh, the Netherlands and places like that. You have a lot of economies uh, in Northern Europe that are very free market oriented, except they have a big welfare state. Then as you move south in Europe, you have the big welfare state, but your rule of law isn't as good. You have more regulation. Uh, uh, and, and, and so your overall grades get worse. Uh, the U.S. gets a better grade than, say, Sweden and Denmark on size of government. Not that we're great. You know, you have to go to Hong Kong and Singapore to actually get good grades on those things. But we're better than Sweden and Denmark on size of government, but we're actually not as good as Sweden and Denmark on these other measures of free market policy, regulation, rule of law, uh, trade, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and, and but above that, even if we are just looking very narrowly at fiscal policy, uh, Sweden does a better job. Because when I said not all spending is created equal, not all taxes are created equal, Sweden raises revenue. They have to raise a lot of it because government's more than 50% of GDP. But Sweden, per dollar raised, or I guess in their case, per kroner raised, has a very good tax system. Now, in the aggregate, because it has to collect 50% plus of GDP, it's a bad tax system. But per currency unit raised, they do, they go out of their way to try to figure out how not to do damage to their economy. So considering you know, how high the burden of government is, their top tax rate is relatively low. 57% is high, but you know, it's low considering how big government is. Uh, they, uh, they have their corporate tax rate is, I think, only 28%. They have less double taxation of capital than we do in the United States. Uh, but even then, on the spending side, they have things like private Social Security accounts for part of their retirement and the part that's still run by the government. It's actually what's called a notional defined contribution account. So what you get when you retire is directly connected to the amount of payroll tax that you paid. And when you retire determines how much you get from the government. So, so it's automatically self-adjusting as lifespans increase. Uh, if you want to retire at age 65 and lifespans are increasing, you get a smaller check from the government. And then, of course, you get some from your personal retirement account as well. So, so if, you're going, if you believe philosophically in big government, then I would strongly encourage you to look at Sweden and Denmark as a model because it's a very efficient, rational form of big government. It's causing them to grow slower. Sweden, when they first began putting in the welfare state in the late 60s, they were, I think it was the fourth or fifth richest economy in the world. And now they've fallen down, I don't know, somewhere around 15. So, so it's hurt them. They're not growing as fast. But, but if you go down the route of a big government welfare state, Sweden is a model. It's very non-corrupt, very strong protection of property rights, very good rule of law, uh, very little regulation. You know, they do everything as well as it could possibly be done in Sweden and Denmark, but it's still a mistake. 
they're still growing slower as a result. And because they, every country has this baby boom generation issue, I don't think they'll ever get to the Greek stage, but you know, 15, 25 years from now, they're gonna be having their own problems even though they have this self-adjusting uh, social security system, they're still gonna have all the age-related healthcare spending issues. So, so even, even for the Swedes, which are the admirable welfare state country and the Danes and stuff like that, they're even gonna have their problems and the rest of Europe, of course, is doing it far worse and so they'll have bigger issues. Dan, you talk about the five free market policy measures, rule of law, trade, monetary policy, regulation, and fiscal policy. By fiscal policy, do you mean size of government? Is that where size of government fits in? Well, it's size of government, uh, but it's also... The you talk about size of government, we talk about Sweden just now. And yes. Is it, it, that where it fits in, really? That's where it fits in. Is, is, is government spending 50% of GDP? Is it 30% of GDP? Mm -hmm. Is it 15% of GDP? You know, Hong Kong and Singapore, very small size of government. U.S. Mm -hmm. historically medium size of government. Now we're closer to large size of government. And the European welfare states, big size of government. And so the question is, if you have the big size of government, are you compounding that mistake with lots of regulation? Mm -hmm. Or are you minimizing that mistake by being laissez-faire? That's why I'm saying Sweden and Denmark are examples of countries that are at least are offsetting uh, the damage of a big welfare state by being very free market in other ways. Uh, we have time for about two questions. Uh, Cadet Faust, and we'll have time for one more after that. Uh, they're experiencing strong growth because they're, they start it from a very, very low level. I don't know the figures right offhand, but uh, uh, I think the last time I looked at the World Bank figures, per capita GDP in the U.S. was something like 45000 a year, in China it's 6000 So they're still way, way behind us. But 25 years ago, they were probably 1000 So going from 1000 to 6000 in the space of 20, 25 years, that's obviously a big growth rate, but 6,000 compared to 45,000 or whatever it is in the U.S., uh, or for that matter, 100,000 in Liechtenstein, you know, China has a long, long way to go. And because of those problems that you identified, I think those problems are going to, in effect, be like a glass ceiling for China unless they fix their problems with the rule of law, with the government uh, intervention and the allocation of credit and capital, the, the preferential policies for the princelings and stuff like that, uh, you know, unless they deal with the titling and the property rights. You know, China may never become even, a, they're still a poor country on average, not the dire starvation level that they used to be with the cultural revolution and all the horrors of that, uh, but they become sort of a medium level. Uh, they're trying to transition from a poor country to a middle income country. Uh, well, I doubt that they'll get too far into the middle income country level before they just hit uh, a point where they can't go any farther unless they solve these other problems. Uh, so yes, China has, China has done amazing things in 25 years, but when you start out in utter, dire, misery, poverty, starvation level economy, it's like North Korea. If North Korea ever even did one-tenth of economic freedom, they'd obviously have great growth rates for a long time because you're starting at a level where people starve to death. So yeah, you, when, when you start at that level, you can, you can make big improvements, uh, but how far you can get it really depends on additional reforms. And last question. Cadet Slater. So continuing on that, in developing countries, once you, if you're able to establish kind of that rule of law baseline, is it important to really, to move forward, is it better to focus on one of those four indices or to really just try and improve them all at once or all, all together? Well, I'd probably give a biased answer because I'm a fiscal policy guy, but I suppose uh, to be fair, it's just any place you can make an improvement, especially an area where you're lagging behind. Uh, that's probably the simple thing to do is, is to look at that Economic Freedom of the World Index from the Fraser Institute. You can see for the different categories, you know, the five big categories, but then a bunch of subcategories. You can look at the measures. You can see where you're falling back, uh, uh, where you're behind other countries, and that's what you should fix. 
that would be the simplest thing. Just it's just like you know your students. You're taking what three, four, five, whatever classes a semester. Uh, you know if you're getting A's in three of them, a B in one, and a D in the other, where should you do most of your homework? Well, probably where you're getting a D. Uh, you know, when I was in school, I won't tell you what I did, uh, but you should focus where you're getting a D rather than where you're getting an A or a B. Same thing for countries. Well, this has been really exciting and informative. We can't thank you enough. Um, Dr. Daniel J. Mitchell, as all of you know, he's a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, and he's co-founder of the Center for Freedom and Prosperity. Thanks so much for joining us here today at the Citadel. It has been enlightening. Thank you. Thank you.